at any rate, um, yeah, uh, okay. Steve, I'm Jack Zutko. I, I know we've corresponded, so uh, hi, and, and, and thanks again for joining us today. Um, so uh, everyone, Steve Yablo is a Canadian philosopher and David W. Skinner, professor of philosophy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He taught previously at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He specializes in philosophy of logic, philosophy of mind, metaphysics, philosophy of language, and philosophy of mathematics. He was profiled in 2018 in the Oxford Review of Books, and I posted a link to this profile on the announcement, so you should have a look at this. Um, and among his most influential publications, and there's quite a few in this category, um, are Paradox Without Self-Reference, The Short Piece in Analysis in 1993, and of course, Mental Causation in the Philosophical Review in 1992. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, Steve, to our uh, colloquium today. Thanks for joining us. Well, it's lovely to see you all, and I appreciate being there. I've been, I've been working for ages and ages on the same cluster of issues, and I think one of the earliest presentations was was at your department a million years ago. I think oh, Adam really? Morton was here, right? Yeah, it, I was. Uh, I think it was called uh, "Non Catastrophic Presupposition Failure" or something like that. But it's it's it, the, the issues have to do with does that ring a bell for any? You, nobody wants to date themselves, but it might have been about 2005 or something. Or something. No, um, we had a couple of nods in the room, so I think there were people who remember that. Yeah, I think those are embarrassed hanging heads, not nods, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, um, so I've been interested in sort of subject matter and how subject matter could. Uh, possibly be a, a, a co-equal partner in content with truth conditions and different applications of, of notions like that. And um, and today I want to try to work some of that into the issue of logical omniscience, which years I said to myself, I can remember when I was, when I was a, a young faculty member at Michigan, and I heard that Bob Stolniker was going from Cornell to MIT, and I thought, oh my God, there's a loss to philosophy. Now he's only going to work on like logic and computer science issues, like logical omniscience. Who knows what that is? And I still don't know what it is, but at least I've had the chance to talk to him. He's the one who I think he might have coined the term anyway. He certainly has written influentially about it. So let me just start. Um, oops. Oh, I'm going to go here. All right. So let's. Let's start with um, something we can, we can agree on. Um, we have various ways of thinking about belief, and those ways are probably more respectful of the empirical aspects of belief, belief formation, belief revision, than they are of logical aspects of belief, belief formation, belief revision. This is famously true of Bayesianism, where I automatically wind up knowing all logical or mathematical truths. Um, because your your creedal state is represented with a probability function, which in probability functions assign one to all all logical truths and all necessary truths. Um, the fact that logical aspects of belief kind of have eluded capture so far doesn't really itself make for a single overarching omniscience problem. You might as well talk about like the the problem of the ultimate structure of the world. It's like a million, a million different uh, uh, problems, and different things elude capture on different on different theories. So let me talk about a couple of reasons to wonder whether there is such a thing as the problem of logical omniscience. And then I'm I never going to quite narrow it down, but at least I'll indicate some things I'm not going to be talking about. So look, there's a lot of different models of the attitudes out there. Um, I mentioned the Bayesian model. Different models misfire in different ways. So if you're a Bayesian, the logical consequences of your belief are seen automatically. You automatically believe consequences of your of your um, of what you believe. I mean, if you have some, I'm, I'm assuming that we have some Lockean kind of cut off what counts as a belief, uh, just because 
um, uh, weaker propositions get higher probability in a probability calculus. Uh, uh, now you could switch to a belief block model that says, well, what you believe is sort of the contents of the sentences that are in your belief box, uh, which is some sort of mythical structure in your, in your cognitive architecture. But here it seems that one could miss even obvious consequences. There's no reason why someone who believed P and Q would have to also believe Q and P. They might just want to run that consequence. Uh, so the real problem is to try to come up with a model of the attitudes that kind of helps to clarify why we're, we're very good at seeing certain logical connections and have a lot of trouble with other ones. And in other cases, we seem to actually almost deliberately flout logical connections, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. The other thing is that there's various kinds of logical underperformance that are out there, and they may well require different treatment. And so the one that's, well, one that's got a lot of attention lately is, you know, some, some proofs are just like really complicated. And so it makes sense that kind of resource limited uh, cognizers might only see consequences that they can reach in five or seven steps. In whatever is their their um, I see I'm looking at I'm looking at my picture of you on the screen, which is not where the camera is. Um, so there are people, um, you know, who have tried to sort of say try to use some kind of competence performance distinction and say we only have so much time to do to do logic or to draw the consequences out from some. Thing that we believe, and so we, we we eventually run out of steam. There's a wonderful example, I think, of this kind of uh, reasoning failure in, uh, I think it's through the looking glass, where uh, the Red Queen gives Alice a problem that she can't solve, even though on its face it's very simple. She says, she asks Alice, what does she know? She says, she knows arithmetic. She says, oh, just, what's one and 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 one? And Alice says, I don't know, I lost count. Because she can't do addition. That's what the Red Queen concludes. Well, so certainly, you know, there's certainly, all of us would have difficulty giving the answer to what, you know, and there's a rapid fire succession of one and one and one and one. All of us would have trouble figuring out whether not, 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 but it's really a combinatorial problem and you just can't count the negations. You know what's going on. So that's one kind of, let's call that broadly a processing issue. There's probably a lot of subcategories here. Then there's failures of imagination. Maybe it's hard to think of counterexamples in many cases, even though they're out there. There's a, there's a whole, well, they're used, I mean, maybe things have probably moved on since my day, but, there used to be a book called Counterexamples in Topology that took like almost any thesis you could think of, like every locally compact house or space is blah, 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 and would dream up and tell you, no, 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 because of this. And it's the thing you'd never think of on your own. And there's also um, you know, failure, of course, to think of, think of the proof. Failures of perception, not seeing why a certain factor needs to be attended to in the first place. How is that even relevant to what I'm trying to uh, think about here? The contemporary problem, the, I'm trying to narrow down a little bit, started in epistemic logic, where people like Hintika started treating knowledge and belief as modal operators, quantifiers over worlds. So just like on standard modal logic, box phi holds in a world just in case phi holds in every world that the first world can see, every world accessible from the first world. On standard epistemic logic, at least old school epistemic logic, you believe something if you're, you, there, there's something that's imagined to be your total belief state, and then your 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 the representation of that is a set of worlds which worlds, the ones that are compatible with your belief state. So all the ways the worlds could be without violating your picture of how matters stand. And knowledge could be uh, represented that way too. But modal operators are closed under entailment. As you know, if phi implies psi, then box phi implies box psi. And similarly for, for diamond. And so if you're going to treat knowledge and belief as quantifiers over worlds, you get these bad results. And so here's Hintika, who did more than anyone to, to sort of advocate for this model and saw this problem. 
in Knowledge and Belief, 1962, it is clearly admissible to infer he knows that R from he knows that P solely on the basis that R follows logically from P for the person in question. I, I love this sort of, uh, there is an older gentler tradition of philosophy where they say something completely obvious and then they go on to, to explain it. The, my funny, the, I'm sorry, I'm digressing, but my favorite example of this is, is Matt, Mackie in The Cement of the Universe uh, in trying to sort of motivate the counterfactual theory of causation because this long quote from, from Mill where Mill says, if a man would go to a restaurant and partake of a particular dish and shortly thereafter die, uh, such that he would not have died had he not partaken of that particular dish and about five more classes to the same effect. And he says, then he would, I think, be tempted to say that the man had died because of partaking of that. <laughs> and Mackie says, we would indeed. And move, and move on. <laughs> this is a little bit like that. He says, or the person in question may fail to see that P and tails are. And then in case you can't see why they would fail to see it, it says, particularly if P and R are relatively complicated statements. You say, oh yeah, that's true. That does sometimes make it things hard to see. Okay, this applies to belief too, not just knowledge, and even more so, in fact, much more so to other attitudes. So although I won't be emphasizing this terribly much, some of the questions coming up here arise in much sharper form for other attitudes than belief. Uh, so I regret betraying my friend. Uh, it follows from I betrayed my friend, but I have a friend. Do I regret having a friend? No, just the, the opposite. I, I, I would regret it if I didn't have a friend. I'm, I have the, the anti-regret is my attitude towards having a friend. Um, where in the case of logical omniscience, usually, you know, if you believe R and there's a consequence, there's a consequence R, the question is, well, why don't you also believe R? Usually it's not that you actually positively deny R, although we can talk about those kinds of cases. One typically only fails to believe R, whereas in the case of regret, one has the opposite attitude sometimes to the to the consequences uh, of, of you know or, or desire. I want this is some example. You know, I want to catch a spy. Uh, well, you can't catch a spy unless there are spies. Do I want there to be spies? No, my desire somehow presupposes that there are spies. It doesn't take there being spies as a. It's not not a point in favor of a world that it has spies. It's just I take it this world has some. And given that, I want to catch them. Okay. So one common response, or it used to be a common response, is like epistemic logic concerns idealized thinkers. We abstract away from, say, memory limitations or the amount of time people spend on things or just sort of quality of reasoning. This kind of response seems to have fallen out of fashion. People are taking a more sort of explanatory approach to failures of omniscience these days. One reason is it can seem reasonable in some cases, not just a lapse, to believe P while remaining uncertain of R, or to believe R and S while remaining uncertain of their conjunction. The second case is fairly obvious. That's kind of like the lottery paradox. You know, you could, eventually, you know, it makes sense to believe that you, you didn't win, your own ticket didn't win, but you also make sense to believe everyone else that their ticket didn't win. If you start doing conjunctions, you wind up believing that nobody won, which is contrary to what you actually think. I mean, some silly, I mean, cases where it could be reasonable to believe P while remaining uncertain of R, they're all controversial. But I mean, an example of, of Kripke's, Kripke's dogmatism paradox is, you know, I've left the house, I'm, uh, pretty, you know, I'm sure I turned the the stove off. Um, what follows from I turned the stove off that any evidence that might turn up to the effect, pointing to the conclusion that I didn't turn the stove off, say the house catching fire or fire engines around the house, that evidence is misleading. It follows, but if mis mis misleading just means evidence against the truth. Then it follows from, I turned the stove off, that any evidence to the contrary is misleading. But you might think, uh, I believe that I turned the stove off. We don't believe that any evidence to the contrary is misleading. Now, of course, there's lots of ways of trying to explain this away, but just on the, on, on the face of it, there's a bit of an issue. Or just think of ordinary anti-skeptical uh, uh, con conclusions uh, that you might draw from a piece of 
common sense knowledge. Okay. Or think of, you know, I believe that my car is where I left in the parking lot. Do I believe that no one stole it in the last 20 minutes or last two hours? You know, this is the kind of example that's usually discussed in connection with knowledge, but you can also discuss it in connection with belief. Okay. No one expects desire to carry through from P to its consequence R, and no one expects R and S to be desirable because each of the conjuncts are. R and S could be a disaster from a desire point of view when each of R and S is desirable. Should belief be different? Can it be different given that we want to have a lot of generalizations about what happens if you believe this and believe something that, you know, you desire this and you believe you'll get it only if blah. It seems like the contents should have similar properties to appear both uh, 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 in the context of belief and desire. And, and, and third, look, it's not just for, for uh, idealized thinkers that logical questions arise, they arise for regular thinkers too. Mustn't even a regular thinker believe R and S if they believe S and R? That's not, I mean, people don't usually, you know, say, oh yeah, I believe snow is white and cold, but I hadn't put it together that it's cold, that it's cold and white. Um, and you know, it doesn't usually say, oh, good guy, break. You only, it's only so many hours in the day. You almost, you know, at least some case to be made for thinking that if you believe the one that believe the other, I suppose I believe snow is white. Do I believe snow is white and snow is white? It might, it might well seem that uh, as a logical matter, uh, I do. Um, I'm not saying that's, that's the case, but it's just, yeah. Um, so the goal became us finding excuses for kind of illogical looking uh, attitude combinations, but more like just making sense of them. Why, why do they occur when they do? Um, are they always lapses? Do they ever do anything for us? Um, sometimes it's giving a genealogy, form. like how did this come about? And was it an adaptive mechanism that, 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 that generated it? Um, okay, so the most common approach to logical omniscience problems today is the, what's sometimes called the information access approach, and I'm, it's, I'm keeping it pretty vague what it is, but here's an example from Augustine Rayo and Adam Elga, and this is an example of reverse, reverse phone books, which apparently used to be much more common, uh, um, but a reverse, you know, a normal phone book, the list the names alphabetically, and then there's all these numbers that come afterwards. The first phone book lists the numbers in order, and then you, and then it has the names on the right hand side. And apparently, this was valued by con people and so-called hackers, uh, which I think meant a different thing in this setting. A hacker needs to get information from the person at five 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 five. He uses a reverse phone book to get the name and then the name to gain the person's confidence. He calls that number and says, oh, is this blah, blah, blah. I actually used to do this myself as a telephone solicitor in Toronto at age 13. Uh, he wants the reverse phone book, not because, so what we do, actually, it was a bit different. We didn't have a reverse phone book, but we just go, like, go down a, 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 a list of numbers. Most of them were like, like half of them were like Jiffy Lubes or gas stations. And stuff. I was trying to sell McLean's magazine and we would dial this like random number essentially. And then the person would pick up and, and, I, and then I would say, let me first check your number to make sure I've made no errors in dialing. So as though like to give them the impression that I was really trying to call them as opposed to other people. Anyway, so uh, the, the, the hacker wants the reverse phone book, not because it contains different information, um, you could you could always figure out a person's number by going through all the numbers in the book until you saw their name on the right hand side. Uh, but because of the way it allows them to access that information, when you organize the same information differently, it gives different. Hold on, let me just this up. It makes certain kinds of certain bits of information easier to find, and other bits of information harder to find. It's like different sort of like Dewey Decimal System versus other kinds of organizing schemes. Sorry. Uh, okay. So information could be easier or harder to get a hold of depending on how it is stored and what we need it for. Uh, so a regular phone book makes it easy to answer what's his number, but... My name is Chris Daly. My name is Nick Peterson. 
<laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, can, I can answer. Oh, Sally says hi to everybody. But no. <laughs> Actually, we're going to text me the name of two particular people to say hi to, but she hasn't yet. So. Um, uh, uh, so with the regular phone book, I, I can answer what's his number, but I have trouble with who's its person for a given number. So I have to look at the whole book and find five, 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 five. Um, even the way this thing can make a difference to whether I believe it or not, or how hard it is to arrive at a belief uh, on the matter. So, so here's some sentences in the left-hand column. I, I have E for easy and H for hard. With a regular phone book, Smith's number is blah, is easy. That number's person is Smith, is hard. It's hard to figure that out. I might well probably, I mean, this this example isn't, isn't perfect. It's hard to figure it out. But of course, by the time I figure it out, E, I'll probably very likely believe H as well. But nevertheless, there, you can see that there's some difference in the accessibility of information depending on how it's formulated. Here's the thing everybody who's ever done calculus knows, you know, they first do differential calculus, and then they do uh, integral calculus, and, um, and and they do it in that order because the first is easier. So everybody knows, like, I hope this isn't wrong, the derivative of x cubed over 3 is x squared. Um, that's, you know, you learn that right away, but they don't even let you near finding the integral of x squared is x cubed over 3 until somewhat later. Or think of squaring numbers versus finding the square roots. So it's much easier to know what a number square is to know what a number square root is. But in a way, it's the same information both 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 times. It's 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 just that you are asked to come up with that information in response to a different kind of question. Different parts of the information are, are given and different parts are sort of interrogated. Uh, here's an example that happened to me. I don't know if it's believable or not, but the following can happen. You're looking for the remote. At some point, you actually picked up the remote, but you forgot to stop looking for it, and you keep <laughs> on walking around the house looking for the remote, and, and, and someone says, where's the remote? And you don't know the answer. You know, you're trying to watch it. You don't know the answer. And then someone will, will say in a certain tone of voice, oh, yeah, well, what's in your hand? And even without looking, you might say, the remote. Right, because you, you knew that your hand contained the remote as an answer to what's in your hand, but not as an answer to where's the remote. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I at least have spent some time looking for things that I actually had in my hand because I forgot to stop looking for them. Because I got distracted right when I found them or something. Okay. Um, so that's a very common way of thinking of omniscient issues in terms of access. The access route is not inevitable. Um, granted that E and H are equivalent, is it clear that they express the same information? That's what we've been assuming. They do on some theories. If contents are sets of verifying worlds, then they express the same information. But if contents are sets of verifying states, states of the world, truth makers for the sentence in question, for instance, they may not be. Statements true in the same world may differ in why they are true, the particular aspects of the world that make them true. And it may happen, for instance, that logically equivalent sentences are true because of different aspects of the world. So the reason that, uh, you know, no humans are immortal, that I'm not immortal and you're not immortal and you're not immortal, the reason that no immortals are human is that Zeus isn't human and blah, blah, blah. I don't know who the immortals are. Uh, okay. Or it could be trivially true because there are no immortals. Um, so the question arises on either approach, different differential access versus different information. How one can believe E but not H when the equivalence is so obvious? Um, and here's the basic idea of this paper. It's harder to explain this if believing S is believing that a certain set bold F of worlds contains the actual world. That's what that at symbol is for. Then if it's believing that a certain type of fact, small bold s, holds in the actual world. Okay, a couple of side notes here. Relation to Frege's puzzle. On the one hand, it's puzzling why equivalent information should make itself less apparent in one form, form H, 
than another form, form E. Uh, on the other hand, of course, it's famously puzzling why information should be less evident in the form, say, H2O is wet than the form water is wet. You might know that water is wet without knowing that H2O is wet. This is the same puzzle. This is just the same puzzle twice over. Well, say we're the same information theorists. It's the same information, just differently presented. Then the Frege's puzzle seems to turn on word size shifts in how that information is presented. Logical omniscience turns on sentence size shifts. Shifts. There needn't be a difference in the words involved. You can have logically equivalent senses involving the same words, like no Fs are Gs, and no Gs are Fs. Those are logically equivalent. Uh, the same words are involved, but there could be a problem getting from the one uh, 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 to the other. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah. Say we're different information theorists. I'm going to be. Uh, then Frege's puzzle turns on word size, word base shifts in which information is presented, and the omniscience puzzle turns on sentence base shifts in which information is presented. It being assumed throughout that the two sentences are equivalent. Either way, the, I'm going to skip this part because I'm running behind. Okay, so this, oh, this part said there's really two different questions. One is a semantic question. One is, a, one is a metaphysical slash cognitive question. How should attitudes work that easy thoughts are different from hard thoughts? Um, the other, and the second is how should attitude reports work that to, to reflect whatever was the difference in the attitudes that made the one harder to get into than the other? And I'm gonna, you might think the cognitive thing is the important thing, but in fact, the problem as it traditionally arose um, was prompted by the, the, the thought that a certain semantics for belief reports sort of makes it impossible to truly describe someone believing P while not believing Q if Q is logically or even necessarily equivalent to P. So the standard answer for belief at, the semantics of belief attribution, um, uh, if, you're a, if, you do, if you have a possible world semantics approach, which is the kind that I kind of mentioned at the beginning, is that A believes P is true, just in case the individual A bears the relation bell expressed by beliefs to, I just put uprights around P, the content of P. And now there's two questions, what is the content of P and what is it to bear bell to that content? The other standard answer going back to Hintika is, well, the content is a coarse grain set of worlds proposition, I write that bold P, and the relation is, the, the proposition, the set of worlds, should hold in each world compatible with A's belief state. So if you think of A's belief state as itself a set of worlds, uh, all the worlds compatible with A's total take on reality, then A believes bold P, just in case bold P holds in each world in uh, that's compatible with A's belief state. So I believe snow is white because all the worlds allowed by my total belief state are snow is white worlds. I do not believe there is snow in the Gustagalpa, just if some worlds allowed by my belief state, not ruled out by my, leap, my, by my belief state, have to Gustagalpa free of snow. Okay, the standard answer, I'm speeding up because I, I can see I'm going way too slow. The standard answer runs into closure problems. So from content, just remember there was content and relation, so just from content, the idea that a belief report is true just in case the person bears a certain relation to the set of worlds proposition, you automatically get that I believe P, then I believe Q, when P is necessarily equivalent to Q. In other words, when they express the same set of worlds proposition. Are you guys getting feedback or something? Is that something weird? Um, no. I think it's largely fine. Okay, good. All right, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but of course, equivalence doesn't seem to hold, uh, you know, on the ground. To believe if A then A is not to believe if A then B or if B then then A. The, both of those are logical truths. Uh, to believe the axioms of a theory is not to believe their conjunction with some difficult theorem that the, the axioms are logically equivalent to their conjunction with a difficult uh, theorem and therefore necessarily equivalent. 
There's a more general single pre premise closure problem that doesn't rely just on content, but uses relation as well. So I won't go into the argument, but you can easily figure it out. Um, from the two together, it follows that if you believe P, then you believe whatever P entails. Because roughly, if every world compatible with your belief state is a P world, then it's definitely going to be an R world, because every P world is an R world. <coughs> and that, of course, seems wrong. And so to give a, an example of Bob Stonecker's, uh, William III thought at a certain point that England could avoid war with France. It follows from that that England can avoid, could avoid nuclear war with France. Uh, did he believe that England could avoid nuclear war with France? Well, no, he couldn't even, he didn't understand that sentence. He lacked the concepts to even formulate the hypothesis that England could avoid nuclear war with France. <coughs> you could get a counterexample to equivalence as well. He probably didn't believe that England could avoid both nuclear and non-nuclear war with France. I mean, that's arguable, but you could say it's, it, you could say it's irresponsible to attribute such a belief to him because it suggests that he keep on believing that it could avoid nuclear war if he found out it could have, that, it, that the other contract was wrong. But truly, there's no such disposition on his part. A bunch of multi-premise closure principles are forced in this too. Conjunction, if you believe R and S, then you believe they're conjunction. But there are cases, and, there, and I can, I'll mention a famous one later on, you might believe this could be any any uh, transitive relation, but I'll just say parallel. You might believe X is parallel to Y. You might believe Y is parallel to Z without believing that all three are parallel, even though that, fo that follows. Um, David Lewis gives this famous example of, he, he believes that Nassau Street is parallel to the railway tracks. He believes that Nassau Street is parallel to the power lines. I'm going to change the example a bit. He never asked, he never drew the consequence that the power lines would then have to be parallel to the railway tracks. If he did, he would have seen that was wrong because when you take the train, the power, the power lines clearly cross over the, 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 the railway tracks. So that's conjunction modus ponens, believing P, believing P then R should mean believing R, but give the example from before. I believe I turned the stove off. I believe that if so, then contrary evidence is misleading while well, being unsure that contrary evidence is misleading. You might not like that example. We could, we could try others. You could do brain and a bad examples. Uh, explosion. Um, A believes PK for an inconsistent set of premises PK follows that you believe the absurd. Well, nobody believes the absurd, so it would seem. Uh, but you often believe a bunch of things that are mutually inconsistent. For instance, all the premises of a, of a Sorites argument look pretty darn good. I don't feel like rejecting any of them, uh, but they they entail a contradiction. Uh, th there isn't even a good candidate. Well, that's the bad one. That first one wasn't really read. No. Uh, I mean, it's all the, the answers are like highly theoretical. No one is saying, oh, we shouldn't. Everything there has a very strong hold on common sense. Okay. So well, I'm going to focus on equivalence to start with. How do we get a believes P without A believes Q when the two are equivalent. We'll compare the problem, uh, a very old problem, which, I don't know, is Phil there? Phil? Corkum? No? Okay, well, this is just to him. Sorry, I'll leave that one. Sorry? Sorry, no, well, Phil's not here right now. Sorry. Okay, well, you could tell him that I mentioned this. This is the problem of uh, identity over time. How do you arrange for X is red at time T without X is red at time U? And there's three standard approaches. One mucks typically with the complement, the verb, or the subject. So the structure property approach says, well, look, it's really that X is red at time, red at T, but not red at U. Those are two different properties. The temporal parts approach, the Lewis approach, is uh, there's these two objects, not two properties, but two objects. X at T is red, but X at U is not red. And the third, the third possibility is to tense the copula. That's, that's yeah, working on the verb. So X is T red, or X is at T red, but not X is at U red, or X is now red, but not X was then red, or something like that. And the corresponding options for us are structured content. What's really going on is you believe the structured proposition that P, but not the structured proposition that Q. 
There's some difference at the level of structure, which might take some work to figure out. Um, then there's the fragmentation approach. That's like temporal parts. There's, you, you break this subject into these two individuals. There's a P and there's a Q. It's the same proposition, but one person, the one sort of approaching it, the one thinking to themselves P does believe it, and the other one, when thinking to themselves Q, doesn't, or one fragment, one subpersonal agent. Then there's adverbialism. Um, a believes this single proposition, P, Q, P, Lee, but not Q, Lee. There's two different ways of believing. So you might think P, believing at P, Lee could be believing under the nation invested by sentence P or something else. But in fact, the, the main proponent of this view, uh, Seth Yeltsin, has a different application in mind. So now I'm going to give an example that all of these seem to have problems with in a new proposal combining elements of each. So here's an, ex if you've heard this example, sorry, this is the way it is with real life example. So I say, are there six letter words ending in MT? That's as long as I dare wait. Uh, people often can't initially say, well, why not? Were they not aware that dreamt is a word of English? In other words, why now tell you dreamt is a word of English? Do you say, I had no idea. Is that related to the word dream or something? You know? No, you knew already. You already knew all along that dreamt was the past tense of dream. That's not news to you. You just couldn't think of it at that moment. Um, you also were very aware that if dreamt is a six letter word of English, then English has ending in MT, then English has six letter words ending in MT. That's, you believed if D then Q, but you didn't believe, you didn't know whether English had six letter words ending in MT. So it seems like you believe two premises of a modus ponens argument, but you didn't believe the conclusion. You already believed, you couldn't call it to mind, but you believed, otherwise you would have said, wow, thanks for telling me when I mentioned it that dreamt was a similar word ending in MT. Uh, and you already believe that if so, then words like that exist. I mean, it's not like I gave you an instance of FA and there exists an XFX and you said, whoa, that's interesting. <laughs> um, but you didn't know that a six letter word exists that ends in MT. Larry Powers, who gives an example kind of like this, is, is, is a bit different. Uh, <clears throat> it, uh, gives this example from uh, Plato somewhere says that your beliefs are like a flock of birds. They're all out there flying around in your head, but they don't always come when you call. So, it, so you believe it because there's a bird there like with that written on its belly, but it didn't come when you, when you said, any birds up there with this property? They don't always listen. Um, so this is a failure of closure under modus ponens, but we get an, a failure of equivalence uh, if we introduce, this is some artificial, but I like it. Uh, let P be the disjunction. Dreamt is a, is a six-letter word ending in MT. Or there are such words. Okay, that, that's logically equivalent to there are such words just because in general, FA or there are Fs is equivalent to there are Fs. FA is strictly strong. I mean, a, a disjunction is always equivalent to its weakest disjunct. Um, so we, so, but we believe that all along too, right? I and mean, it's not as though I, 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 I come along, I say, oh, did you know that either dreamt is a six letter word or there are some? I say, I don't know why, I don't see any reason why you, it isn't, it isn't news to you. <laughs> that, I mean, if it wasn't news to you that dreamt was one, then it wasn't used, news to you that dreamt is one or blah. So I'm gonna as assume, people sometimes question this, we believe P all along too, but P is necessarily equivalent to there are six letters, words ending in MT, which we've not believed all along or so it seems. So here's some things that the, the characters I mentioned before could say. The structuralist might say, well, the structured proposition that P was believed all along, but not the structured proposition that Q, the fragmentalist is probably gonna say, well, these two propositions, D and if D then Q, were believed by different fragments, different subpersonal agents or something like that. And the adverbialist is probably gonna say, well, this, this one and the same proposition, Q, which is P, was believed all along, but only in the P way, not in the Q way. Um, 
so here's my problems with these views, and then I'll say my own view. Structured content makes room for failures. It says, look, of course, it's possible that this structured proposition is in your belief box, or a sentence with that structure is in your belief box, uh, but the other structure isn't represented in your belief box. But it doesn't at all explain why that would so why that would be so. It just sort of says something does it. Uh, in fact, there are patterns. I mean, we don't generally think that people that believe A and B can easily fail to believe B, B and A. I'm not saying there are no counterexamples, but on the whole, that's a difficult thing to do. But if, but, but if, if we're just talking about the contents of belief boxes, there's, there's, they're all just different sentences. There's no obvious reason why any, there should be any sort of completeness conditions on the ones that are in there. And of course, people wheel in stories about implicit belief as well. Um, um, so that's something to think about another time. Um, uh, we've got uh, dreamt is a six letter word of the right kind and the conditional, if it is, then there are such words. Why are they not put together if we believe both? They're both in the belief box. Usually in the belief box, if you've got A and if A then B, then you, you count as believing B. For some reason, this one is very resistant. Well, clearly it's something to do with the answer we want to give is something to do with the availability of SD, dreamt as a six letter word, for inference. We believe it, but not in a way that we can bring it to bear in reasoning. There's nothing in the structured content model that explains that. Well, fragment, fragmentalism says that dreamt as a six letter word, et cetera, was unavailable because it was sort of elsewhere. It was in another fragment. Uh, not the fragment controlling your question answering behavior evidently because you weren't able to answer the question so who's to say that um if you, you can say that if you like but who's to say that it's there with there is a six letter word with this property was not else also elsewhere i mean you're just postulating that it was not also elsewhere because that's fits the data but it really looks like you're you're reverse engineering what's there and what fragment just it's a post hoc rationalization, if you like, more than a real explanation. After all, boldface Q is the same proposition as boldface P, and the sentence P explicitly was believed. So the puzzling combination here, belief, say, D, if D, then Q, D or Q, but not Q, is at best stipulated. It's not really explained. Adverbialists say, and this is the I'm just using the main application that I get from Yeltsin, Seth Yeltsin, the paper called Belief is Question Sensitive. Um, they say that a P, bold P, believe via poorer concepts may not be believed via richer ones. So William III thinks war is avoidable, but not nuclear and new non-nuclear war are both uh, avoidable. Uh, and that makes sense because he doesn't have the additional concepts that you, you might not be able to sort of grasp the 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 original content in the manner indicated uh, by the by the more complex sentence because the complex sentence draws lines in logical space that you that you yourself don't know how to draw so your partition if you like of logical space isn't as fine grained as that <clears throat> but if you look at the case that I just mentioned there is a six letter word blah 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 versus dreamt is such a word or there is such a word the right hand disjunct is conception the right hand sentence the disjunctive one is conceptually richer for example it has the word dreamt in it and it has disjunction in it but that's the one that's believed it's the richer one that's believed not the poorer one so to the extent that that a verbalist is explaining failures of belief by saying well i just can't grasp it that way because i don't have the right lines in my grid that's not gonna help you did have the lines in your grid you just weren't accessing them and there may be a version of adverbialism that that follows that up so i'm not saying i mean i think there probably is all right so here's my my strategy q though equivalent to p puts demands on different aspects of reality albeit necessarily co-satisfied demands that's a change in subject matter just like no f's or g's puts demands on the f's whereas no g's or f's puts demands on yeah so it's like think of the difference between i don't know if you remember this bush era uh, policy no child is left behind that puts demands on like children had better be taught uh it's equivalent to no one left behind is a child 
I mean, you could, you could arrange for that by speed aging. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> you could age the people you're leaving behind. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. This is also a reason to think that uh, if if you think the aim of science is to discover all truths, you don't want to just sort of write write that as like all truths are discovered because then scientists would be motivated to destroy any parts of <laughs> get rid of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There be okay. less reality or like that. Yeah, that's right. I didn't feed all my children. I just, you know, etc. Okay. So incorporating, let's drop that one. Incorporating subject matters into content yields what I call directed content. So the new approach is supposed to, I may not get to all this, resemble structuralism in making contents finer grained than sets of worlds, but our contents will be unstructured. They're basically <laughs> something like dappled sets of worlds. They're sets of worlds broken apart according to shared reasons for why a sentence would be would be true. This is a notion of subject matter that Dave Lewis develops in a few papers a long, a long time ago. It's going to appeal like adverbialism to carvings of logical space. Like so, for instance, to, to grasp a content as disjunctive is to grasp it as the union of two smaller, more natural sets of worlds. That's what it's to see it at, you know, it's just like a, like a conjecture, etio, conjecture of etiology for the content, whereby there are these simpler sets when you put them together. So you might think of charge, some of you might think of charged particle that way as, well, it's the negatively charged or the positively. Or some of you might think of charged particle as the basic thing, and then it's got a positive flavor and a negative flavor. And I think this can be a genuine cognitive difference. Uh, it, 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 uh, it controls intuitions about whether one claim is part of another claim. Is this is charged part of it's positively charged? Well, not if positively charged just at the disjunction. So that'd be like saying red is part of red or white. But anyway, on the other approach, it would be. Um, and then the, the new approach is going to also see obstacles to the pooling of information like fragmentationism. But how, how hard two premises are to combine turns less on cognitive architecture or where things are stored than on how their subject matters relate. They just might not, they might just be playing different different games, so to speak, and they might be somewhat kind of logically incommensurate with each other. The ways for them, even if R and S are true in the same worlds, uh, or w whether they are or not, if they draw sufficiently different kinds of lines in logical space, logical space, you might not be able to combine the two sets of, of lines. Uh, topic sensitive belief. So as before, A believes Q is going to be true if A bears the belief relation to the content of Q. But now we reconceive content. Now, in, as I explained the possible world semantics account of belief report, uh, the content of Q is actually the set of Q worlds. Uh, it's actually better seen, for reasons I won't go into, as two sets of worlds: the set of Q worlds and the set of not Q worlds, because there could be there could be worlds where neither neither where Q is unvaluable. So I'm just going to assume that that's so, and it'll make it easier to do the transition. Uh, now we're going to have not two sets of worlds, but two sets of states. So contents on the new approach are going to be blackboard Q plus. That's the set of Q's truth makers. The truth maker is small bold Q with an upward arrow and blackboard Q minus the set of uh, false makers uh, represented by, uh, schematically by small bold Q downward facing arrow. Now we can't really expect to define the belief relation anymore than Hindeker really does, because it tells what compatibility with your belief state is. Uh, but roughly or intuitively, it is the motivating thought, a state of the world S vindicates or refutes me if I will have, thereby, to that extent, turn out to be right or wrong, if it turns out to obtain. So I'm vindicated. In other words, it's, a, it's, it's, it's like if a certain state obtains, and I could rightly say, that's the kind of thing I thought might happen, then I'm vindicated, uh, et cetera. Okay. Um, and so... A bears the belief relation to black, 
to uh, blackboard Q plus Q minus, if and only if A is vindicated by each truth maker for Q and refuted by each false maker. Okay, so much concerns the semantics. Of, this is the, the place that the paper starts to sort of get interesting, and it's going to go by so quickly that that uh, uh, you'll say you should have hurried earlier, not now. But let's see what we can do. So, so much concerns the semantics of belief reports. A believes P does not entail A believes Q, since P and Q, even if necessarily equivalent, are liable to differ in subject matter, truth makers, false makers. But if the goal is to actually explain closure failures, not just make room for the possibility of closure failures, then you need to hook the semantics up somehow with beliefs. Cognitive matter does a person go into a Q state, the kind of state whereby she is right or wrong to the extent that a truth maker or a false maker holds. So I'm just gonna coin a term here that I'm gonna use in formulating a conjecture about when as a cognitive matter, we go into a Q state. Let the winning Qs, so, so by bold Q without the upper, the arrow, I just mean either one, either a truth maker or a false maker, all those deciders. So the winning deciders are the ones that actually obtain in our world. If you think that only one can obtain, then it's, then it's the winning decider, is the one that obtains in our world. So there's all these different facts that can verify Q, and that can falsify Q. You can't have, assuming Q is not both true and false, the ones that obtain are all gonna be on the truth-making side or the false-making side. So the winning ones, this is a, here's a question. The, are the winning ones truth-makers or are they false-makers? They're all gonna be the same. Q, Q can't be both true and false. Here's my unsigned conjecture. This is sort of like full cognitive science. I go into a Q state if my best guess about the winning Qs that they are truth makers rather than false makers. My best guess is that the kind of facts bearing on truth value, Q's truth value out there are gonna bear positively. And so a lot is gonna depend on how people come up with their best guesses about the winning Qs. And that's what we consider next. So I'm gonna abstract away from the details of the present case and the present case is, is the winner a truth maker or a false maker? I want to ask more generally, how do you arrive at your best guess as to whether the Fs are G or, or not G? And I'm going to say there's two main strategies. There's a bottom-up strategy. First, try to identify the Fs and then ask, are they G? Once you've got them in hand. Then there's a top-down. Don't try to identify the Fs. Just think whether Fs as such are likely to be G. And which strategy makes sense to use depends on the case. So suppose I say, the tallest person in the room wears glasses. Here, the top-down strategy doesn't really make much sense. You know, I can't say, well, a tall person, would they wear glasses? Well, you know, well, maybe they're so far from the ground that they won't be able to see things, you know. <laughs> maybe. But, but if I say, the nearest sighted person wear glasses, I'm not going to use the bottom-up strategy. I have no idea. Let's get the, who's nearsighted here, right? No, <laughs> it, you know it's in the nature of nearsightedness. You're liable to wear glasses. I always run into somebody who finds this insensitive to the phenomenon of nearsightedness because there's anyway, there's a lot of things that could mean that the person that the nearsighted person isn't wearing glasses. But let's just go with it. Uh, now let F B is a winner and G B is a truth maker. I go into a Q state, I said if my best guess read the winners, is that they're truth makers, not false makers. Now which strategy do we use for so here's an example? The tallest person in the room will run a three minute mile today. I think it we're not gonna use the bottom up strategy. That would mean, well, everybody line up. Let's see who's the tallest. You are okay, let's follow you around and see if you run a three minute mile today. That's not a good way to go. Nobody has ever run a three minute mile and nobody maybe ever will. No point in hunting for the person. Uh, the winning cue will have to be a call maker since the sentence is, is false. You know right now, the tallest person will not run a three minute mile. But compare the tallest person with the knees today. Here it might make sense to find the tallest person and follow them around all day, see if they sneeze. Maybe it might even make sense to try to get them to sneeze so you can stop following them around. Okay. 
Here we, that's the bottom up method. Now, some examples of, of how this applies to the cases in question. So there's a six letter word ending in MT. So I think that when we're asked this, we have no top down intuitions. We don't think, hmm, six letter word, hmm, ending in MT. What does a six letter word do that kind of thing? You know how they, you know how they roll six letter words, you know? Are they liable to sort of wind up in this territory of the ones that end in MT? No, you have no useful intuitions of that kind. So, um, also, you're not going to look for false makers for there's a six letter word ending in MT. Because the form of a false maker for that is blah, blah, blah. Okay. All right. So, let's go back to the example of there's a six letter word ending in MT. And let's conceive our task as we're thinking of all the truth makers or false makers for that. And how are we going to form a guess as to whether the winning cue, so to speak, is a truth maker or a false maker? So you might first ask, well, what are your top down intuitions? In other words, is there anything analogous to what we had with nearsightedness and wearing glasses? You say, hmm, six letter word. Is that likely to end in MT or something like that? You know, it seems like you have very you have no intuitions of that of that kind. <clears throat> so the top down is 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 not gonna work very well. We have to look for particular look around for particular false makers or truth makers. Well, if you think about it, a false maker is gonna be this enormous fact. A false maker is gonna be a hypothesis about what all the words are of English. And then going through each of them and noting that they don't, each of them doesn't end in MT. Or each of them either isn't six letters long <coughs> or doesn't end in MT. There's no way you're going to think of a false maker for English has a six letter word ending in MT. So your only real chance of making a guesstimate about, what, about whether the winner is a truth maker or false maker is to look for a truth maker, to actually try to think of an example of a six letter word ending in MT, which is what you do. Uh, it, and it kind of makes sense that you would. And, it, and either you think of it or you don't. If you do, then you'll, you'll believe that English has such a word. And if you don't, then you, then you won't. So you guys, does English have any eight letter words with only one vowel? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you what? Yeah, sometimes the question itself is a clue. Yeah, okay, well, you, you have to do the rest of the class to. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so that, that's one example of how the semantics could interact with the cognitive task we face. Are we going to go into a state that constitutes us a believer that there's a six letter word ending in MT? If you look at the truth and false makers, the top down method is not going to work. So you have to look for, is there, can I think of a false maker? Can I think of a truth maker? You can't think of a false maker because you, you have to then know all the words of English. So all you could do is think of a truth maker, which is in fact what you do. So the, the sort of toy, cognitive psychology that came out of this is is working so far all right uh, should, I, should i wait now that the clear's here yes, oh you can continue you can continue so take the oh, oh. okay oh yeah i can you get slides up too or <clears throat> i popped it out i think <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about we it. We'll just see look at the dog. Yeah, we, just, yeah. we, we like the dog. Okay. Okay. Slides any place. No, let, let's just keep going. Okay. Keep going. Yep. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Here's a here's a here's an example that won't mean anything to you, or maybe it would. I don't know. And but so. I've never lived in a town with a winning sports team before, until we moved to New England. And then all of a sudden, all the teams started winning. And 
the Patriots, like, are widely regarded as, the New England Patriots are widely regarded as, like, they just keep on winning and winning and winning. They're coming to the end of that. But, so I did, I wrote this slide in, which you can't see, in June, so one of the facts are in now. But if you looked around and checked with people, you give them the sentence, the Patriots are going to win the Super Bowl again. A lot of people would say, yes. More people would say that than anything else. And a lot of knowledgeable football people would say, yeah, I hate to say it. Everybody hates the Patriots, but I hate they're going to win again. Now, you might ask, that's that's weird. Why do people say that? It's New England, although by far the winningest team in the last 20 years, has only won the Super Bowl a third of the time since 2002. It's won a half of the time since 2014. Uh, the... Las Vegas odds against it are, it was about one to four. Um, so why do people say the Patriots were gonna win the Super Bowl again? Well, let's use our strategy. You look, you try to figure out if the winning cue is likelier to be on the truth maker side or the false maker side. The truth makers for the Patriots winning the Super Bowl again are, well, they win, that's the truth maker. The false makers are this other team wins, this other team wins, this other team wins. Well, if you pick any particular other team, it isn't as likely to win as the Patriots. And so that's why you're inclined to think that the Patriots are going to win, because the likeliest candidate for a winning few is the Patriots. This is a known phenomenon in, in cognitive science. It's called the alternative outcomes effect. You can, you can hold an event's probability fixed, but change its believability by making the other events even less probable. And this is sort of an example of that. Now here's a sentence that's logically equivalent to the Patriots are gonna win. The Ravens, the 49ers, the Chiefs, blah, 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 are all going to lose next year. Nobody believes that. Uh, why? Well, because it's very easy to think of, uh, uh, so truth, truth makers for that, would be 25 teams all lose. False makers are like the Ravens win, or somebody else wins, or somebody else wins. The false makers are all much likelier that all of those teams would lose. And so the model kind of predicts that you'd find that less plausible, even though it's, it's, it's logically equivalent. Patriots are gonna win, is logically equivalent to everyone else is gonna lose. But even to me, subjectively, <clears throat> knowing all this, I find it much more believable. I find it unbelievable that everyone else is going to lose. And it's somewhat believable the Patriots are going to win. Right now, it's not so clear, but they're 10 and 2. Um, okay. So then there's a bit about. Can you see the slides now? Or? Yeah. No, no, we haven't been able to do it. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so. I'll just say a couple more times. If you just stop stop presenting and then present again. So stop stop the presentation and then do it again. You mean uh, uh, do the stream? Uh, no, he no, just no, presses no. the stop button. Yeah, just 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 stop sharing. Can you stop the sharing? Not hard enough though. Stop no, no, sharing. Okay. No. Stop. I'll start again. A little icon that looks like a computer there. Yeah, I'm doing it. Okay, and then Hold start on. it again. It hasn't now it's been a there we go great yeah. slides coming up yep yay yeah now we can see thanks sorry yay. yeah we can see yeah. now thank you Claire thank you Peter. all right so we had these different closure principles that seem to fail we wanted an explanation of why they fail so I'm gonna just for a couple of them why they would fail, and then there's a, a final part which we can decide whether to do or not, maybe not. Um, well, suppose that P and Q are equivalent, they're true in the same world, the boldface uh, P is identical to the boldface Q because that's the, the set of world's propositions. But it could be that, the, but they have different truth makers and false makers. It could be that the truth makers that come to mind for P enjoy a credibility advantage over the false makers that come to mind for P <clears throat> the, the truth makers for Q does not enjoy over the false makers for Q. And that's exactly what happens with the Patriots will win versus the other teams will all lose. 
The truth maker that comes to mind for the Patriots will win is something like they'll win. The false makers are all inferior teams or teams that haven't won as much. And so you're going to pick the Patriots to win over those. I'm not saying whether we should describe this as like a cognitive error or if this is really belief is, is different than you might have thought. But I'm just saying this is a natural way to think. Whereas if I switch to the other teams will lose, the truth maker, everybody else loses, seems like fantastically less probable than that the, the Chiefs win or the Ravens win or somebody else. There's only one team that's got to win other than this huge coincidence. So it's kind of a glass half full, glass half empty kind of thing. But the thing is that once you're doing bottom up, you're much more inclined to do pairwise comparisons between the most promising truth makers and the most promising false makers. And, and, and so if the truth makers and false makers change, those comparisons are going to come out different. <coughs> um, here's how entailment can fail. P entails R, but the truth makers for P that come to mind enjoy an advantage over the false makers for P that come to mind that salient truth makers for R do not enjoy over salient false makers for R. So if I give you dreamt as a six letter word ending in MT, the truth maker for that is kind of itself. And it comes to mind immediately because it's given by the sentence. You don't have to hunt around for it. <coughs> But then if I give you there is a six letter word, it's just a question whether a truth maker for that comes to mind or not. It might or it might not. If it does come to mind for you, then you'll find R plausible. But if not, then you'll think I know P, but I don't know R. I can't tell whether R. Here's one, one final example for conjunction. It could be that the truth makers for R and enjoy, enjoy an advantage over the false makers for R and the ones for S over the false makers for S but the truth makers for R and S do not enjoy an advantage over the ones for false makers for R and S because it's obvious why R and S would be false in a way that it wasn't obvious why uh, either R or S would be false. So the first hypothesis is pictured on the left. NASA street runs parallel to the tracks. Seems plausible if you picture them. Let's say they're a hundred yards apart. I have no idea. Uh, the power lines are in parallel to the tracks. Sure. I mean, I can, I can almost visualize what could well be a truth maker. I, I can't distinguish it from a truth maker in my mind's eye anyway. But now when we can join those, we get as part of the conjunction that all three run parallel. But I can easily think of a false maker for that because the tracks are right near the power lines and they clearly cross them. So, that's a case where there's a, if you like, an emergent false maker. Uh, there's a false maker for the conjunction that didn't, there was nothing corresponding to it for either conjunct. And so that's why it'll suddenly seem less plausible. That's why you would believe one conjunct and the other, but not the, not the third. Not the, that, that's, that's the suggestion. Okay. Now there's a few slides on logical insight. Should I do those or just skip them and we can stop? I'm happy to start. I think it's hard to do them. Like, we're not in any rush to leave. So, yeah, if you can do them, that'd be great. That good. Okay. So, the flip side of logical ignorance, of course, is logical insight. Um, and I want to talk about that because that's what's really interesting moving from ignorance to understanding things. What is it? I mean, it's related to the issue of what logical and mathematical knowledge are. I don't have a, a real story about this, but just a, a, a few thoughts. Mostly, this is a chance to display my historical learning with some obscure quotes from, from Frege. So, <laughs> so Frege discussed this. So he, so that we start with an you know, inchoate, inarticulate sense of validity. So um, let it be the validity of sentences. Some sentences just strike us as obviously right in a way that just strikes us as special. I'll just call that validity. P or not P, if P then P, that kind of thing. Uh, Frege says, in this, when you discover something and you don't have an analytic grasp of it, you just sort of like, well, oh, these seem different. He, sa he says, you just coin a term for it. If something has been discovered that is simple or at least must count as simple for the time being, we shall have to coin a term for it. There's nothing for it but to lead the reader or hearer by means of hints 
to understand the word as is intended. I say, like validity, you know, like in this case, in that case, but not in that case. And so here's what, here, let's just suppose what we've got here is, this is not really logical space, but you've got, let's just suppose you've got all the different, uh, let's suppose this is like a, a, the, the hypothesis that a single sentence is logically true or is valid. I should have said, I changed it from logical truth to valid. And so I've just got this, this is where the sentence is, is, is valid. These are all the worlds where it's valid. I mean, it's metaphors here aren't quite hanging together because you don't not think, you might think of it as a necessary feature of the sentence, or you can think of a sentence as having different meanings in different worlds. And so it's validity comes, comes and goes, but best not to worry too much about that. Um, now, then someone thinks of provability. There's provability in a formal system and <coughs> Provability is an analytically articulate notion. It's an existential notion. Phi is provable if there is a proof of it. So the same region that was just a single solid blob before that you would grasp just intuitively. And Frege is really big on this sort of Kantian intellectual intuition jargon where you just sort of see it all at once, but not analytically. You don't see where that comes from. And when you get provability, then the region is represented to you as the union of regions each tied to a specific would-be proof. Because it's provable just in case that's a proof, or that's a proof, or that's a proof, or that's a proof. There's nine billion ways. Only one of them, you know, there might be like 10 of them that work. There are these 10 proofs, uh, but most things aren't proofs. Um, so now you've re- You've got a, an analytic recarving of the region, uh, so you now see it as the union of a bunch of smaller regions, and that's one form of logical insight to realize that it's the same region both times. That's, yeah. And the idea that it's the same region both times is something like an analog of the church Turing thesis for computability. You've got the intuitive, intuitive notion of computability, it just comes all at once. It's just like an intuition. And then someone suggests an articulate thing. And then you have to say, oh, is this articulate thing the same as the intuitive thing? And as people always say about church Turing, there's no simple answer to that, but it seems to sort of capture the cases that we can think of. And that's roughly the relation between provability and intuitive uh, validity. Okay, so one first conceives the region atomically, then analytically as a union of regions indexed the different possible proofs. Those are would be truth makers for it's provable. Completeness, which is the meta theorem that phi is provable if and only if it lacks counter models, gives a third way of conceiving the region because now we've got all the hypotheses that this is a counter model to the to, to phi, or that is a counter model to phi, or that is a counter. So those are like the gray grapes on the outside. Okay, and then you take the complements of those, those are, that is not a counter model, that is not a counter model. The argument is, uh, the, the statement is semantically valid if all of those, that is not a counter model statements are true. Everything is not a counter model to five. So now we can conceive this region, approach it from above. We now see it as the intersection of a bunch of larger regions each to the effect that blah is not a counter model to phi. Uh, and so now we've got three different approaches to the very same region, the sort of atomic intuitive notion, the seeing it as a union and seeing it as a, as a, an intersection. This isn't really quite, quite true, but in, this isn't really an example of that, but in, 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 in logic, people will, or in model theory, people will talk about, well, certain notions are sigma, you can represent them with existentially quantified formulas. And other notions are pi. You can represent them with universally quantified formulas. And then there's some that are both sigma delta. Those are special. Uh, this is not, it, this might or might not be a case of that, depending on this. There's a lot of different versions of that, of that, of that, of that hierarchy. But, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's kind of like that. It, it, uh, the, the, there's two there's two different lines of sight on the very same region of logical space, then that sort of makes it a nice region. Um, so that a region is arrived at first, sorry, that a region that was arrived at first intuitively and then from below by unioning 
potential syntactic truth makers proofs can be reached also from above by intersecting the complements of would be semantic false makers was of course a huge discovery. That's what Girdle proved in 1930 or something or 31. Somebody there probably knows better than I do. Um, and it was a huge discovery. Like many discoveries, it was one like it wasn't obvious that anywhere you really saw it as in need of proof until it was proved. I mean, it, like he almost articulated the hypothesis more clearly than it had been in the course of proving it. I might be wrong about that. But so the suggestion is that logical mathematical insight can be modeled in some cases. This is a model uh, as recognizing a familiar region of logical space as just our old friend, validity that we knew from when we were kids, but it now turns up in a new guide. And this brings logical omniscience strangely close to Frege's puzzle because our excuse for believing P without Q, if you think of them both, if you like, as names of the region, <laughs> Uh, well, they present the region, or symbols for the region, they present the regions differently. So we miss, like Hesperus and Phosphorus. So we miss that it was the same region both times. And this is, of course, a metaphor with all the problems that metaphors have, but it's a metaphor that Frege himself was drawn to. So here's, here's some quotes, which I'm definitely misreading one of them, but they, anyway. So he says, if we represent contents, he's really talking about kinds of concepts, not, not contents in, in, in the contemporary sense, by areas on a plane, this is admittedly a picture that may be used only with caution, but here it can do us good service. Initially, we see everything as through a fog, blurred and undifferentiated. That's kind of like having an atomic notion of validity. It's what Descartes would call a clear but indistinct idea. You know, it's like you have a powerful, there's something special here, but I don't quite know what its boundaries are. Uh, uh, and then you try to analyze the, the thing that you saw through a fog. And there might be more than one way of analyzing the same thing, one existential, one universal. And he says, it's not impossible that one way of analyzing a thought should make it appear as a singular judgment, namely that is valid for the atomic notion of valid. Another is a particular judgment, which I, I'm hoping means existential. <laughs> and a third as a universal judgment, when you think it had, everything is not account a counter model, right? So it's sort of like, and this is a big theme of Craig's is the, the multiple analyzability of thoughts. I don't, although I doubt he would apply it to this, to this case. Uh, and then finally, T.S. Eliot in, anticipated all this. Well, you can read the quote, you probably know it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve, in, in, in view of time considerations, I'm going to forego our, our traditional break um, and move right into questions, if that's okay with you. Okay. <laughs> sure. uh, can you hear us okay still? For tradition that you ask me questions or I ask you questions? <laughs> I guess I didn't make that clear. Uh, usually we have two questions, but... Uh, I'd like to hear if you have questions to ask us in our about six-letter words. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what about, is there eight-letter words with only one vowel? Symphony. That's about two. Oh, wow. Why? Wow. Two half, oh no, it's oh, I see. It's, I was thinking it had two half bells, but it has O, it's got, yeah, symphony. All right, if you can, yeah, I, I want, I mean, somebody's so got more than eight letters, right? Yeah. No, it's eight letters. Yeah, you're right. yeah, you're right. Okay, I have a better example. With really literally. <laughs> That's good, okay, though. Yeah. Okay. There's, I mean, I can't give us <laughs> oh, strength. Strength? Strength? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. All right, that's yeah. <laughs> okay. So, maybe, word, if you guys think Y isn't a vowel, which apparently someone there doesn't, what about a five letter word with no vowels? <laughs> Actually, there's I can think of two of them. So, okay, I'll, I'm gonna wait. Myrrh, like myrrh and frankincense. 
And Syzygy. S Z Y D Y. It's sort of a Scrabble word. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Talk about well, something real. You could reverse the polarity here and, and maybe does anyone have a question for Steve? Okay. Um, Howard? Sure. Um, yeah, no, thanks so much. I, I thought I thought this was great. I guess part of what was going on, I had sort of two smallish maybe questions in my mind. One was, is that better for being able to see us? For, that wasn't one of my questions, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. you used up one of your questions. This. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, shoot. Okay. Well, right. So what, uh, what, I, what I was going to ask was, for one, you said these were going to be unstructured or like dappled contents. But I guess if for some other reason we wanted to have structured contents, like structured proposition contents, we could also incorporate what you're saying there, right? There's nothing, is there, is there anything in the approach that requires it to be married to like a dappled world content? Or could you say, I want structured propositions, but I want to understand what it is to sort of believe one of these structured propositions is to um, think it's most likely that it has a truth maker. Or to disbelieve one of, the, to think one of these structured propositions is false, is to think it's most likely to have a false maker. That was one of my questions. And the other was, uh, just with some of the stuff about belief and matching beliefs onto probabilities, um, when you, you, you were describing it as like, you think it's most likely, I guess, is, there, is that gonna run into any problems about you know, there being a specific degree of belief, or is that sufficiently vague that depending on context, what kind of most likeliness you have to think to count as believing it uh, could correspond to different kinds of credences and different kind of contexts. Well, I, whether it was sufficiently vague is a question for you. I think I know the answer. <laughs> I did my best is to that, make it. Is the yes and that's a virtue? What? Oh. Is the answer yes uh, and that's a yeah, 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 it was sort of like, it's a notion, I was, I was trying to work with the notion of, sort of forced choice, best guess kind of thing, which is some people use as sort of alongside probabilities to deal with some problems that probabilities can't, can't deal with. It's notion that Stromlefer uses in various right. yeah. places. So that's even well. Yeah. 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 Um, that's good. I mean, so like, Things that were the epistemic probabilities, at least like Williamson style, wouldn't wouldn't differ. You can still say, still, I like this one. If I had to, yeah, or you know, uh, yeah, okay. Um, but but it's true. That's like totally underdeveloped, and I, I really don't know what I mean by my best guess. I mean, I tend to sort of conceptualize it almost sort of operationally. I was going to make a slide like this where you have like two bags of truth makers and makers and you kind of well even that like, maybe not the right picture because that's a little bit top down you're trying to figure out well which one is heavier overall as opposed to like rifling through them to to, to, to find a oh this yeah. is like a good one yeah and some um, people have to say you don't necessarily believe it you just think it's more likely than not which isn't the same as belief right <laughs> so. yeah, yeah yeah right you might think it's more or you might just think if I had to bet on one, this is the one yeah. I'd bet on. Right, which yeah. is exactly like thinking it's more likely than not, but not necessarily believing that it's true, right? Well, no, it, it, it might, well, no, it, isn't, it might not even be as strong as more likely than not, because it, I had to, the other ones might, it might be like 40% likely, but the other ones are 5% likely. Oh, okay, sure. Sorry, I was, I was, I was assuming it was a proposition investigation and stuff, you know. And well, that, that's one of the first big issues, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, this allows at least for, there's this, you know, this, you know, whole recent belief. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, there he is. Oh, okay, it was temporary. Oh, right. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, most people do not remember that. But you said, like, was it going to be the pragmatic encroachment on belief stuff? No, no. Okay. No, so we'll it was more, more that, uh, Believe in English, well, Williamson says, like, belief is, like, a wonderful phrase, botched knowledge. It's, like, <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. it's really, like, you have to have a consolation prize for people who didn't know stuff or might not know stuff. Right. Sort of, 
Where, but there's this argument that uh, uh, Hawthorne and Rothschild and Specter been giving that. Actually, we use the word belief just like we use the word think. That it's very hard to find it. You know, it's, it sounds almost incoherent to say, "Well, I th are they going to come?" So I think they are. Do you believe they are? I don't believe they are. I think <laughs> uh, we used to, but we'll often say that we think things if they're like just a tiny bit over fifty percent likely, and arguably if they're less than fifty percent likely. So there's this classic experiment where you say, like, there's these five teams. Uh, uh, they each have a 20% chance of winning. Uh, let's see. Uh, is, uh, do you think Team A is going to win? And everybody says, no, of course not. Why wouldn't it be Team B or two? Say, okay, there's like 80 teams. Team A has a 20% chance of winning, and the other ones have whatever, 1% yeah. or yeah. one um, teams. Yeah. Uh, who do you think is going to win? Everybody will say, oh, they may. So, and then <laughs> usual thought is, well, think is this totally weird thing. Mm -hmm. And if you really press them on believe, they say, oh, I don't believe they're going to win. But I don't know. I, well, as soon as I said, I think he is going to win, I, I at least find it a little bit hard to sort of like just back off. I, I believe they're going to win. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it could be that I believe they're going to win if you're for. That's my pick if you're forcing me to pick. That could be a different thing. I mean, there's some very subtle issue. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I wanted to leave open the possibility that you could believe things even if you, that they were less than 50% likely. Sure. Okay. No, I think that's true. I think that's true. Uh, I'd like to move on to another question now from Mattia. Oh. Thank you very much for your talk. So Thank I you. was wondering uh, if uh, in this problem of logical omniscience, uh, the role played by the inter interest of the subject could be more uh, important or crucial. Because I was thinking about the problem of uh, the Nassau Street, and uh, in the case of conjunction, we made a mistake uh, with our beliefs, uh, but when we realize that we made a mistake, we are able to readjust our beliefs or recalibrate them in order to avoid the errors again. And so when you said that uh, the solution based uh, on uh, uh, the structure content is not able, doesn't explain why the problems arise. Maybe introducing this element of uh, how the interest of the subject can influence yeah. Yeah. Uh, the attribution can, can, can be useful because uh, the first intention or the first motivation of the hacker to build up the reverse uh, phone book uh, is to have uh, mm -hmm. a more useful tool for uh, to fulfill his interest, that is to perform the hack. And so yeah. maybe the role of the interest can be more uh, important or more crucial in your model. Well, what, I mean, I'm simply, so in general, I mean, I think it's really right and a good point that there's sort of different models of what might be going on in these fluctuating judgment cases. And, and they do some, differences between them sometimes come out when we're asked to make adjustments and what kind of adjustments you want to make and don't want to make and whether we're irritated at being asked to make to make the adjustment so like uh, here's an example that uh, uh, I, I use with that was based on something that happened with my kids I mean uh, so after this the, the stock market crash or whatever it was in 2000 nine they were trying to put money in the states they were trying to put money back into the economy and in the course of this somebody said like hank paulson or some wall street guy said well you know 400 billion dollars isn't really a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and then and then at that time i was i was giving my son like uh, and it was like and, and, and so I said, like, three silver dollars and two Indian nickels and blah, blah, blah. Or I shouldn't say Indian nickels. Uh, uh, da, 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 isn't a lot of money. That's that's false. You know, cause, cause just using that sort of language already suggests that it's from the perspective of a kid. But now, I mean, suppose I actually think that, you know, three bright, shiny silver dollars and blah, blah, blah. 
is a lot of money, but $400 billion isn't a lot. Then I'm forced to say, unless you're saying that less money can be a lot of money where more money is not a lot of money. I go, you know, I, I didn't, you don't just, you shouldn't mix those. That was like bad manners. So, so look, so I do think, I do think that interests can play. I mean, there's generally three different models people have given, say, in epistemology. There's the, the old fashioned Dretzky relevant alternatives model, like which, which alternatives do you have to rule out to count as knowing? And then there's the uh, newfangled sort of, uh, sorry, then there's the, the sort of um, what degree of uh, uh, confidence is called for given how heavy duty the proposition is, the, the, the non-pragmatic stuff, and then there's the sort of pragmatic encroachment stuff. I don't especially see why pragmatic encroachment Unless there was a lot hanging on whether the, the you know, the, the wires cross the tracks. I don't immediately see why pragmatic or interests would be playing a key role here. I think it's just more, there's less plausible deniability or something because everybody can see why it's false. So it could be different kinds of loose speech and the standards for loose speech are, are it's sort of like, you know, people sometimes say, uh, I, I might say I'm five foot eight inches tall, and someone said, "Someone says, oh really? I'm uh, five seven and three quarters of an inch, and it's actually taller than me. Well, I, I, it isn't really, but I'm just you know. uh, uh, then I, I might have to pull back from saying I'm five foot eight inches tall because they, they're saying, look." I'm talking about a larger subject matter or using higher standards of preci precision than you are. So that's another, so maybe that's another way interest could, could come in in that case because we, we were using low standards of precision in the original parallel judgments, but then suddenly those seem appropriate when you actually see them crossing the other parallel. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a, good, a good point. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Steve? Yeah, Paolo. Paolo, if you could uh, just sure. move up. Uh, <laughs> Not right on top of it, but just closer to the mic. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah, I, I just had a doubt. Um, so, once again, going back to the uh, William III and nuclear word example, I was just uh, wondering how, how do we find a false maker if we don't conceive the possibility of? Of proposition, for example, because I my, I mean, um, is this a, a proposition that although it's well formed and it's uh, understandable its form, it doesn't actually have cognitive value for the believer. And I think this, the, the the model of set of, world, of worlds is a uh, kind of can account easier for that model because it's just the belief is all. The, poss the positive possibility that are in the set of possible words from the perspective of the believer, but in, in the other case, from the facts, we need to account also for the non beliefs and uh, what, what happens when we do not actually believe something. And does it fall beyond the, the domain of belief or something? Yeah. No, that's a really good question. Um, I, I myself think you could, there's a way of, of hearing, uh, you know, England can avoid nuclear and a nuclear war with France, where you could imagine that William III would believe it, even if he didn't know what those kinds of war were, just because he could recognize the logical form of the sentence and he could take a top down approach. It's like, it's like if someone says, Do you have any dogs in your pocket? And I say, No. We say, Well, do you have any big dogs in your pocket? Even if I don't understand the word big, I, I'm still going to say no. I, I have a particular kind of dog. In, in other words, I might, you know, the answer, well, I see that the sentence makes these distinctions, but my basis for asserting it doesn't require me to follow it down that particular grid. And so I think that that could happen. And so I think in some context, you might want to say that. William the I mean I do have more trouble a little bit more trouble with William the Third believes that uh and this is actually another interesting 
reason that closure can fail with the entailment. Like, I don't know what you think about that. Uh, so there's the equivalent sentences, believes can avoid war and believes can avoid both nuclear and non-nuclear. Then there's believes can avoid war, believes can avoid nuclear war. Uh, uh, I, f I feel more reluctant to say he believes they can avoid nuclear war. One reason being that sometimes Well, one reason being, like, suppose, suppose I say, suppose I say, maybe, maybe, suppose I say, uh, uh, you know, no one alive now wants to kill all the Jews. And then you say, what about Hitler? And then in saying that, you've actually changed my, it made me wonder whether I'm right about who all the people are that are alive. You know, maybe you wouldn't ask that unless Hitler was maybe around or something like that. You know what I mean? Or like, everyone is mortal. Or all, all humans are mortal. And, and then you give an example of some mythical figure that I didn't, hadn't really believed in, but, but might be human and might be immortal. I don't know. So, so I guess I'm inclined to think that there might be reason for being careful about saying that William III would just, we just want to attribute to him an implicit belief that they could avoid nuclear war just because he thinks they can avoid war, period. It's, it's sort of like saying someone believes there's no, maybe you thought about it for a long time, you didn't think of any eight letter words with a single vowel. Do I want to then attribute to you the, and you, so maybe you decide there aren't any. And then I say, oh, so you, he must believe that strength is not an eight letter word with a single vowel. Well, that would be a bad inference. So that, that's what worries me a little bit. If you haven't thought of the example, then maybe you shouldn't attri attribute the belief and the consequence. So. But what's your view about, did William III believe that they could avoid nuclear war? No, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I was more, I think I, I, I understand as a general scheme that the fact that uh, we moved from a plane of set of, uh, set of possible worlds to facts, or just to account for the possibility of, of things not happening and not being conceivable. But at the same time, because it, it really feels like a model necessity, the first, the first uh, formulation, like uh, I have my belief, which is uh, true in all possible words. It's, it really sounds more like model necessity, only on, uh, except the fact that it's limited by the extent of the possible words. It's just the words that I, I can put, it's not that I have access to instead of. But it's still some sort of necessity that has to be sort of reviewed. Um, so, but I, in the back, there's always this thinking that I was, I was questioning myself if maybe it goes very well with what we were talking before, like if, if there is an equivalence between thinking and believing. Uh, and if we exactly, we need to, of course, some sort of belief to every single, every single formula or sentence that we actually can uh, conceive in our own language. And I, yeah. I do not believe that is the case. Belief is just uh, probably more like an investment on different, mm -hmm. like it's, it's like probably in my, if I had to, say but a very naive uh, opinion on that, I would just like that William the third, it's not true that he doesn't believe in that, he just cannot conceive the possibility of nuclear war because it maybe he doesn't understand the terms of of the of the proposition. Yeah. So for me, having a model can account for the a sentence being not believable and believable, it, it's kind of a uh, positive uh, element of the model. Yeah, yeah, we do have fluctuating intuitions, and it would be good if you could, if you wouldn't have to like totally switch. Explain why you say the one thing and sometimes I'm not, I'm not. Uh, another complicating factor, factor here is like, it, it sounds wrong to say he does not believe it because um, it's very hard to hear does not believe as just asserting the absence of belief as opposed to belief in the in the negation. Like 
like you know, you might say, uh, maybe there's a kind of fruit I've never heard of, like juju fruit or something. But it would be, I can't really say, I don't, I don't want juju fruit because <laughs> uh, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't want to sort of already convey something stronger, and so. It may be the, the, the lack of a good word for absence of belief uh, on William III's part might, might, might confuse us. You know. yeah. it, may, it, may, it may. Oh, yeah. Uh, of course, let's see here. Yeah. Uh, well, if I may jump in in this case, the case of William III. So I think that William III <coughs> doesn't want nuclear war against France because. Uh, if uh, he doesn't want uh, war against France, he doesn't want war in all the possible means in which war can be fought. And uh, even if, if we go not so far away in nuclear weapons, but uh, if the Lord Chancellor advised him that, uh, I don't know, the French uh, were able to create a new kind of sword or a new kind of uh, strategic military tactics with the cavalry, I think that uh, William III, uh, doesn't want war, even in that case, in this new upgrade version. So, well, so I think let me give a, let me give a different example. Suppose you, this is an example of, of one of my students, Milo, who writes about about, about want. He says, you might ask me if I want milk, but I know that the only milk in the house is sour, so I might say no. But then, if you said, well, do you want sweet milk? You're really weird, or fresh milk? You're really weird to say. He said he didn't want milk, so that includes all kinds of milk, including fresh milk. In fact, fresh milk is the normal kind of milk. <laughs> so, it, it, so uh, but, you know, what, what you want sort of depends on, is intricately tied up with what you, how you think it would come about, or what, how, how that poss general possibility would be realized. And... And, and so for almost any, I mean, you know, Wittgenstein has a funny example uh, where he said, you know, somebody says to the babysitter before they leave, teach the children a game. Then everybody knows the example. And then, and then you, come, you come back hours later and, and the babysitter taught the kids strip poker or something. <laughs> and, I didn't mean that kind of game. <laughs> well, it's a very tricky question. So, were you thinking to yourself, but not strip poker, but thought they wouldn't teach them that? I mean, there's no way you could have completed the thought to yourself. There's some implicit understanding of the ways in which things usually happen that you just sort of rely on. And a hypothesis like nuclear war upsets that understanding, and so that's what makes me a bit hesitant. As opposed to, like, <clears throat> war by, you know, war at noon. You heard of war at noon. So I would be, you know, he didn't want war. He didn't want war at noon. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, those of us who work on Descartes don't have as much of a problem with. Um, I do not believe is not the same thing as I believe not. I do not believe X is not the same as I believe not X. So, but that's because you're dealing with a very different model of yeah. belief. Right? So, um, right. Yeah, but there's something yeah. something to that. Yeah. No, of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, you know, Jane Friedman and people like that write a lot about this. I mean, there's there are gen, you know, and the and the and the and the pure skeptics and so on have notions of suspension of belief that are very that are very uh, uh, certainly it may, the notion makes intuitive sense. There's just a linguistic phenomenon. That's all I was referring to. Sometimes called neg raising, where one is just very hard to. Uh, avoid uh, certain kinds of scopes that seem like they technically ought to be available for the negation wind up not being available. Like so, so here's an example of of uh, Delia. Uh, so you, we're used to thinking that existential quantifiers could have narrow scope or wide scope. That's like the question here. Like, can I, can I not believe versus believe not? Is it, you're saying it could have narrow scope. So suppose I say Aristotle was not a philosopher. Well, you might think, uh, 
I'll, I'll give the not narrow scope. Then I'm saying there is a philosopher who Aristotle was not. He was not Plato. <laughs> you can't read Aristotle was not a philosopher, even though it's a perfectly good thought that Aristotle was not Plato, so that he was not this particular philosopher. But nevertheless, the sentence Aristotle was not a philosopher does not bear that reading for, for unknown, you know, for who knows what reasons. That's all I was suggesting. You know. But, but but it's not as, as extreme a case. I agree. You could you could say, well, I don't believe it, or I don't I don't disbelieve it either. You can say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any follow up? Um, well, kind of. Oh no, it it was going to be another Descartes obsession. Never mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to hear about that. And then it was more embarrassing perhaps than I thought it was. But never mind. Yeah. No, I want to uh, hear about Descartes. Oh. Go for it, Amy. Do you want? Well, I was just going to say the. Um, I mean, in a way, if you, depending on how you want to understand Descartes' account of belief, um, and there is the commitment of the will, which is one of the reasons why you get the suspension. It makes sense. But um, at least, ideally, the content of what you believe is because you actually see how it could be true. Um, you know, you, I mean, so you're not just, so to speak, the content is not, so to speak, the bare fact. It's something like, the fact as confirmed or disconfirmed in some uh, way. And it seems to me that that was actually much closer to to what you're yeah. saying, right? I mean, otherwise, it's yeah. just, just carelessly and indifferently applied your will for no damn reason at all. And that's just psychologically weird and also epistemically um, not desirable. <laughs> so, but yeah, so, so it, but it, that's why I thought there might be a little more similarity. Oh, so, so is, this, oh, is this what you're saying that, or is this related to what you're saying that his sort of quasi voluntarism about belief might seem to fall afoul of like the all this stuff about belief and the will? But if you know, uh, you can't just believe something because someone offers to pay you money to do it. But if it's the mechanism is via perceiving a particular reason yeah. why it's true, then that wouldn't be as much of a problem, or? And it's clear and distinct. I mean, part of what it is yeah. to perceive clearly and distinctly is to perceive how something is true or why right. you should count it as true, and the will follow that. Whereas the case I where it doesn't, you're being careless or, or you know, just boneheaded in some yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I thought he also said he couldn't help. At times, he couldn't help believing what yeah. was true, that it forces yeah. itself on you. If it's totally clear and distinct, then we're just yeah. the wheel is built in such a way that we spontaneously oh, say, ah. Uh -huh. But but again, the point is is that the idea, the kind of yeah. the sort of normative model, if you like, of belief is is not is that the will is directed towards something because you see it, how or what it is that makes it true or disconfirms it. So I thought that that yeah. was rather in line with some of what you were saying. Yeah, which is a very contemporary theme about you know, desire and will, and I because this you know, desire is involving. I, we were just teaching Anscombe about the possibility of wanting a saucer of mud today. If you didn't see this, I don't know, no reason. It's just that I want. Yeah, you, you have to see the point of it uh, to really count. Yeah, that's what she said. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um Good. Uh, we have one more question for you, Steve. Uh, Howard. So this was just a follow-up to uh, maybe I was wondering if I could ask sort of the first thing I was thinking about is kind of a follow-up to Paula's point about how you might lack belief. In, it, it, we, we might sometimes want to say you could lack belief because you lack certain concepts. So I wonder if you could marry, if, if one way to tackle that could be to just take everything you said about in order to count as believing something, you have to, uh, your best guess has to be that there's a truth maker. In order, to think, in order to disbelieve it, your best guess has to be that there's a false maker. But then marry that to like a structured propositions account of content so that you don't count as holding the belief unless you also possess the relevant concept. So if you unpromptedly ask, uh, is William the Third in your example? Is that what it was? Yeah, well, if you unpromptedly ask William the Third, um, or sorry, not, not ask, if you just sort of don't even have a situation where you ask him, you just sort of, he's sitting there and you say, does he, you know, think that England will avoid nuclear war? You might say no, because he doesn't have the concept. 
Um, but if you if you sort of talk to him and said, hey, William, there's this thing called nuclear war. I'm not going to tell you any more than that. Uh, do you think England can avoid that? Then I might be tempted to say, well, he could he could fly the top down because all he knows about this con, he has a, a minimal concept now of nuclear war, which is just it's this kind of war that this guy just told you and just you know mentioned. Uh, and he said, well, since I think they can avoid war, they could avoid this kind of war, whatever that is, right? But um, so so yeah, I mean, do you think that do you think that that would be an option to sort of marry? generally what you're saying here with like a structured propositions account of complete contents? Well, I guess a anything is possible. I've got, I've got, I've got, two, I've got three, my, my, my three reservations. One okay. is it could be o overkill. Uh, and, and I have more specific reasons for thinking that, that what proposition is expressed kind of is a much more free floating thing. Structures are fairly, rigid but the very same sentence my favorite example is uh this one from strassen normally if i say king of france is bald you can't evaluate it but if someone has just said well tell me about the bald people and i say the king of france is bald you, you don't say i can't evaluate that strassen gives this example himself he says uh you know you offer the landlord a certain amount of rent and the landlord says the lodger next door offered me twice that sum. And then you find out there was no lodger. There never was a lodger next door. Go back to the landlord and he said, well, he said, and he says, well, strictly the question of truth or falsity doesn't arise because <laughs> it's empty. <laughs> you know, that's not much of a, 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 a no, an answer. Carol might have used that when he was a slow Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, the other thing is, look, Sometimes you do, you can evaluate hypotheses that you don't fully understand. Like I believe that snow is white, or and then you stick in some piece of theoretical physics that I, I don't understand at all. I I I I think one of the great advantages of truth and false maker theory is that it helps to explain how we're able to evaluate things that we really don't don't understand. I mean, you might ask me, is the is the king of Trafalmador in my pocket? I don't know if Trafalmador is a king. I don't even know if I, you know, I can't remember if it's a real country or if it's a Kurt Vonnegut country or something, uh, but I still can answer the question. And right. truth makers are a good way of like cutting the legs out from under this feeling that you need to know in every, in every case what it would take for it to be true or false. And so I just think you need infinite flexibility and to the extent that I think opportunism is a, is a really valuable thing in, in semantics. I think yeah. truth, uh, structure uh, cuts down your 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 latitude. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, um, Steve, uh, we thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you for a delightful presentation, a good question period, and uh, I really uh, appreciate the question. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah and I got a lot to think about. This was a, a, a great uh, wind-up for our fall uh, uh, colloquium program. So thanks so much for joining us today. Okay, thanks for joining us. I just noticed it's about the same temperature here as it is there, I think. Oh, you're like uh, a surprise. Call me. freezing, right? Yeah, it's, it's, surprisingly, it's surprisingly warm, right. warmer today than usual. That's right. It's okay. supposed, the temperature is supposed to plummet next week. Yeah, so. it's seasonal okay. right now. It's been about my high of minus six or something. Okay. Like that. It's seems more yeah. hot. But I'm so, all right, well, have a great evening and enjoy yeah, all the yeah, yeah, really appreciate it. Please, please say hi to Sally. Yeah, say hi to yeah. Sally. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Bye. 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 Yeah, exactly. We'll resume next week. <laughs>